We are here today with Sam Levin and Dr. Susan Engel, uh, and today we're going to be talking about a book they co-wrote together called The School of Our Own, uh, the story of the first student-run high school and a new vision for American education. So before we start with questions, because I'm dying to talk to them about this, this really cool school they created, I'll introduce them both. So Samuel Levin is the founder of two innovative student-centered programs at his former high school in Massachusetts. The first is Project Sprout, which is a student-run garden, and the second is the Independent Project, which is a school we'll talk about today. He's a graduate of Oxford University, where he's currently pursuing a doctorate in zoology. Dr. Susan Engel is a professor of developmental psychology at Williams College, where she's also the founder and director of the Williams Program in Teaching. She's the author of several books on psychology and education, including The Hungry Mind, which I've interviewed her for previously, and the end of the rainbow, both by the new press. Um, so thank you both for being on the show today. I'm dying to talk to you about this this school you've created. Thank you. Sure. Hi. So I so I want to start kind of right off thinking about. Um, so you created a school that's basically a school within a high school. So the first question, I guess, should be, what makes this school different than the public high school, and why did you feel the need to create a school within? The traditional public high school. Well, I guess the the single most important difference. I mean, the the one the biggest and most important thing that sets apart the independent project from both the public high school it was in and, and every other public high school uh, is that it was uh, student run. Um, so the the school was was run by the high school students who took part in it. Um, and Obviously, there were uh, you know there are a lot of other aspects to it, but I think that is that is the sort of I, I guess take home message. Um, and I I was motivated to start a, a student run school uh, within my public high school uh, mostly out of I guess frustration and, and disappointment with with um, with what I was seeing in, in school around me and experiencing. Um, uh, the biggest thing was that I, I felt that most of my friends. Um, were around, were unhappy basically, and not learning, not motivated, not engaged, and and I knew that they had so much potential, that they were capable of so much more than what I was seeing, and you know, day to day in the classroom, and that just started to kind of uh, uh, drive me up the wall, um, knowing you know, knowing that that they could do so much more, and that so much of their time uh, and and potential is being wasted in school. Right, so. The story, as I understand it, of how you founded this school or when you first got the idea, is really interesting. It looks like you came home from school one day, and you were really frustrated, and you said to your mother, uh, I think I want to, you know, uh, I just can't be this way. This is, something's got to change. Um, well, I guess, like, I don't know, like the way a lot of things get started, uh, I don't think there was anything special about that day other than that it, than that what, uh, other than what came after. Um, so uh, I had been feeling frustrate, frustrated for, for a long time, and it had been growing, uh, I guess, bubbling up. Um, and I had probably complained to my mom at that very dinner table a uh, hundred times before. Um, I don't know if I, uh, I guess my mom can tell you whether I seemed particularly moody or upset that day. <laughs> but um, yeah, anyway, like you said, I, I came home and, and you know, my mom was making dinner, and I was sitting at the table, and I just said, you know, I, I'm just, I can't take it anymore. I'm so sick of seeing uh, all the people around me just listless and unhappy and not learning in school. So I can tell you that one of the things that was so interesting about watching Sam get to that boiling point was that he vacillated between such involvement and drive and intensity for what really mattered to him, whether it was the garden or a um, piece of research he had done over the course of a year studying this pond near our house, um, and the kind of disengagement and it was like a low-grade fever like a lot of his friends had, except the opposite of a fever because it was sort of cold. But this sense that they didn't really care about what they were doing or just going through the motions or trying all the time to figure out what other people wanted from them. And the disparity between that kind of apathy 
or listlessness, and the intensity, the excitement, the drive, the focus he had when he was doing these other things was so striking to me. And so I don't know that he seemed particularly stormy that day, but, but I think he and I were both aware of the difference between what a teenager can be and what public schools tend to call forth for most teacher, teenagers most of the time. Right. Now, I guess here, um, it'd be really good to stress something I found really interesting. When, when people talk about creating, you know, alternative schools and things like that, we, that work for kids who the public school kind of doesn't work for, let's say, we usually think about, uh, oh, those must have been the kids who were really failing in the public school system. Those were the kids who were just really obviously struggling. And you make it a point, both of you in the book, to say, no, we're talking about students really from all over the spectrum. So the students who are failing, obviously, there's, a, there, there's probably a disconnect there, but also the students who are doing really well. Uh, traditional schooling doesn't necessarily uh, serve them best or well either. Can you speak to, to that point? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly uh, my friends uh, spanned the whole spectrum. Uh, I mean, like you say, I had friends who were struggling and didn't do well in school and got bad grades and, uh, you know, knew people who wanted to drop out uh, and maybe had siblings who did. But I also had friends who, you know, planned to go to, you know, top schools and got great grades, but, uh, but they, weren't, they, they weren't getting much out of their education. They certainly weren't becoming passionate about what they were learning. They... They were, like you said, sort of able to, to, to pass the test or do well on the test um, sort of without actually getting so much of a scratch on their you know, mind or their intellectual lives uh, as a result. Um, and, uh, and, you know, which is more frustrating? I mean, it's, the, both problems are equally terrible to watch as a, as a friend, you know, the, the one who you know has has a real shot in life and has a lot, has uh, is capable of being lively and excited and stuff and who's just completely failing in the system and the friend who you know is brilliant and is just sort of wasting their time getting good grades um, so they're, they're both terrible to watch especially I, I felt as a as a student and as a friend sure so let's walk through a little bit of how the school works because it's obviously student run but there is kind of a, a structure to it that really allows for a lot of freedom from students so there's kind of three instruct I don't want to say instructional parts but there's three parts there's kind of a short term short term learning goals there's what's called the individual endeavor and then there's what's called the collective endeavor so let's kind of go through those maybe one by one and talk about your thinking in terms of why is this a valuable component Okay, so yeah, so, so for much of the semester, the day is split in two. Um, and like you said, the afternoons are, are for a, in, an individual endeavor and the mornings are for uh, academics. Um, so the idea of the afternoon portion, uh, was the idea of including that was that one of the big things missing from schools was the chance to, to really master something, to really delve into something. I mean, we spend so much of our time sort of flitting about from subject to subject and worksheet to worksheet and topic to topic. We had really little chance to grapple with something, to, to stick with something and, and, and become as good as we could in, in a, you know, over a long period of time. It, it was something that I saw really missing from school. So the idea was in the afternoon, the whole semester, you took on one individual endeavor and it could be anything. It could be building a boat or writing a play or doing a science experiment and, and all that mattered was that it was a big enough task, a big enough uh, uh, endeavor to, to fill a semester. I mean, it, it couldn't be, uh, I'm going to fold this paper uh, over and over again. Yeah, so that, so that was it. The main purpose was that you had to be excited about it. And obviously, the good thing about that is that when you pursue something hefty like that, it requires all kinds of skills for you to learn along the way, you know. Um, the, you know, building a boat, you've got to learn how to interact with people and learn how to make a budget and balance that and actually do the physical process. You know, you know they, they incorporate a lot of different skill sets. Um, the mornings for the academics uh, was the reason for having that as a required part of it um, was based on the idea that despite what we do in school, which is to track, kind of make people think they're either sort of vocational people or thinkers, was based on the idea that you know everyone is a is a thinker, and all adolescents can can get excited about big ideas um, and and thinking deeply, um, and and even if in regular school not we don't see that side of everyone, everyone has that potential. 
Um, and so we wanted everyone to be exposed to that in the school. And we split our time between the sciences uh, and, and the languages. So in the sciences, each week on Monday, you came up with a natural science and social science question. And then you spent that week uh, exploring, uh, 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 finding the answer, talking to experts, doing your own independent research, reading, whatever, and then taught the answer on Friday um, to the rest of the group. Um, and then in the languages, we did math and, and English uh, language. And for that, you uh, someone chose a book for the group to read uh, each week. And then on Friday, we shared. Uh, we did. We each wrote a sort of response to the book, and we shared that with each other. Uh, and then for the math, uh, we um, we engage. We everyone chose math problems that they're excited about. Be that the math of uh, winning a hand of poker or um, trying to describe the spread of elephant populations with random walks. Um, and then finally, yeah, like you said, the last portion of the program was a collective endeavor. So we all teamed up to tackle some real world problem, some real issue in our community or, uh, or, or further abroad. Um, and the purpose being there that, that we missed any real chance at collaboration in traditional school. We might have little projects where we, we sort of pretended to work together on a poster, but not the real kind of engagement and interaction with other people that, that real the situations in the real world, jobs and challenges and stuff actually call for. So I would just, listening to Sam talk, I was thinking about something, which is we tend to measure the outcome of high school in terms of the specific knowledge or skills that students have. But developmental psychologists know that one of the key aspects of adolescent development is how we, how a teenager experiences him or herself, what kind of person he experiences himself being. And one of the things that I found so fascinating watching the independent project unfold was watching all these kids from very different backgrounds and with very different sort of um, expectations for themselves experience themselves in two ways that they hadn't before, as being deeply engaged, not just diligent, not just compliant, but really engaged in every way in what they were doing. And two, as Sam said, to experience themselves as thinkers, as capable of pursuing an idea. Right. So let's go into uh, the starting of, of this school and kind of the, the once the ideas were kind of roughly formulated and you, you started, you decided to see if this was an actual possibility. Uh, one of the things that struck me there is that you had to run this by the uh, curriculum steering committee and then the school committee. Um, and some faculty members especially were a little bit resistant. Um, I think some of them kind of expressed doubt that students would learn on their own, that they could be trusted to learn on their own. Maybe others uh, distrusted the idea that they would get the, all the stuff they're supposed to get rather than everyone going their own way. Can you talk a little bit about that resistance? Why you think that resistance exists or existed and um, kind of how you, how you convinced them? Um, one is how the number of adults who are so worried at, at the stuff students might not get in this different innovative program which always makes me laugh because most students aren't getting that stuff anyway. You know, it's not, you're not risking all that much. The idea that there's some golden piece of knowledge they have to get, and if they don't get it, they're going to perish. Where, well, if that were true, many students would have perished by now because it doesn't even work the way, the way, that it, the way it's been functioning. And the only other thing I was going to say is that, and I know Sam has a different answer to this, more concrete and specific about his experience, but I'm quite fascinated by uh, how fearful adults are of adolescents, uh, fearful of the crazy anarchy that will unfold if they're given some autonomy or some responsibility. I don't know quite where that comes from, because there's very little evidence to suggest that that's the case, both historically or looking around the world at teenagers in different places. They're not the wild, crazy creatures that many adults fear they are. Yeah, I mean, I, and I guess uh, to add on to that, to answer the part of the question about how we, you know, how I went about convincing them. Um, so I was a I was a junior in high school when I when I decided to start the school, and and over that it was over the course of my junior year that I was trying to implement it and make it become a thing. Um, and I guess in the beginning, um, you know, people were very clearly in, the teachers were very clearly in three camps. 
there was a small minority of, of teachers who were uh, open to the idea. They maybe had some doubts, but they also had a lot of doubts about the way they were doing things and you know how 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 you know how well the, the current system was working. Um, and so they were open to it and they were ready to be on board. Um, then th there were the uh, a whole bunch of people, the majority of them, who were sort of on the fence. They 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 were kind of they were kind of reluctant to make a big change because it takes work and it's kind of scary. Or they had a lot of doubts, but you know they didn't feel that strongly. And then there was this minor, small minority of teachers who were just thought it was so crazy it infuriated them. Really, the idea that that you could give high schoolers some independence. Um, and so what it was was a year of persistence, really. I mean, a year of going to the meeting and getting their feedback and talking and discussing and then leaving and coming back with changes and stuff one after another to slowly win over the people who were on the fence. So let's turn to uh, some of the pedagogical uh, kind of takeaways because you devote a few chapters to some of the things that, that this school can really kind of uh, uh, demonstrate. So one of the chapters is about requiring mastery. So individual endeavor, the uh, I guess the, the smaller projects where students kind of learn individually about questions they're interested in. I mean the stipulation is that there's mastery that's required. Um, and what's interesting about that is the traditional way a school day is set up is almost sure not to give a person the chance to develop mastery at anything because it's broken up into about eight short periods. Um, and you and you're rushing over a ton of curriculum. You know these endless lists of things you must learn, and so shallowness is sort of a given. And one of the ideas that Sam had, I think, or I sort of watched him develop as he planned the school, was what is it? What do you need to do to make sure that a teenager can come a math something? You need to give them the chance to pick something they really want to be a master of. No one gets to be master of something they don't care about or that they're just doing because they they have to. That's a basic psychological principle. And then the second thing, which seems almost equally obvious but rarely is sort of played out in, in schools, is it takes time to become a master of something. You cannot do it in 30 minutes three times a week. Uh, you need significant time. You need and, and the kind of time you have, whether it's with others or alone or with books or with research materials or wood and glue, depends on obviously what you're pursuing. But, but nothing good or deep or complex was ever uh, mastered in a period a day. Uh, and I think that that's one thing we haven't talked about yet was that Sam started with what he thought of as the most important educational goals of the school and he worked backwards to figure out well if that's our goal what would it take in the school day to achieve that goal yeah, and I think the other piece that we that we haven't yet mentioned which was a big well one of the biggest motivating factors for including this element in the program was that it mastery it, it just it feels amazing you know it feels great to just to really commit yourself to something and to throw yourself into it and and to work at it day and 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 you know day in and day out, um, there's very little else quite like it. And and I and I had had I had been lucky enough to experience that in things like the garden that I that I started or other you know other things outside of school. Um, uh, but I knew that it was missing in school, and I, it didn't seem fair that that no one had that chance to experience it. And and you know like what we're talking about, I knew that once. Once kids got a chance to feel what it was like to really dive into something and grapple with it, it would make them crave more of that. And it, I'm thinking about, like I said, adults and their fear of teenagers, but one of the interesting things that we often do with our institutions, like, like many high schools, is we focus so much on making the school a place to limit their worst qualities that we've we've missed the chance to make a school a place that capitalizes on their best qualities because teenagers have some some frailties, some vulnerabilities that sort of go with the territory of, of puberty and a huge developmental transition and uh, but they also have enormous intellectual energy, physical energy, uh, unprecedented interest in the social world around them and intellectual capacities they haven't had before. 
And so one way of thinking about this is how could you make a school that worries less about their weaknesses and instead does the most to bring out their strengths? And I think that the, the things that were built into the independent project have, have a lot of promise for doing that. So one um, thing I've talked to, you know, some colleagues and some other people about this uh, the independent project in the book because it's really very fascinating. And, um, you know, a lot of them who express agreement kind of wonder to me uh, whether this would scale, I guess, downward in terms of, okay, so this could work for high school. High schoolers have the executive functioning to kind of be able to take on a long-term project with, with minimal guidance and things like that. So um, I, I'm wondering if you've had experience with or you've thought about whether this or something like it could scale down to middle school level or the elementary level, maybe with certain scaffolds or, or whatnot. Well, uh, I guess I'll, I'll start just start by saying that it's certainly something um, we've thought about, or uh, definitely I've thought about, because you know after after when the independent project ended, uh, we made this film about um, about the program and what we did because we all felt you know we wanted to share this with, with as many people as possible. We want other high schoolers to have a chance to try to, to experience what we did, um, and and uh, you know I wasn't very surprised to hear from high school students and principals and teachers and parents. Uh, but I was surprised that I ended up hearing from, you know, all over the country from elementary school teachers and parents as well. So it's, it's certainly something that, that a lot of, you know, people are, uh, have wondered about and asked about. Um, but, uh, you, you know, and, and my, I guess my feeling and, and my mom, you know, might, might, uh, might have a different take on it. But it, it's just that, you know, I, I wouldn't, transplant an exact copy of the independent project into sort of an elementary school um, but uh, but I, I would take principles uh, from it and, and try to bring them into the classroom yeah I mean I would just agree with that so the whole idea of the independent project was to make the most of the unique capacities and characteristics of teenagers and and make a place where they could sort of move in a meaningful and gradual way towards adulthood. And so by the same token, if you were to transpose some of this or, or use it in some way to guide what you did with elementary school kids, you'd want to think carefully about their developmental needs, who they are. They're not going to be able to be autonomous in the way that teenagers are, and uh, they learn in a different way, and their relationship to adults is significantly different than the relationship teenagers have to adults. That said, wouldn't it be amazing if we started helping kids to identify what they're interested in, to work together in meaningful and serious ways, to care about their community, and to sort of help each other learn? Wouldn't it be amazing if we started them on that path when they were in elementary school? Yeah, I guess um, to that point, some of my colleagues who have mentioned you know, that kind of question, when I thought aloud to them, I thought, well, do we have a potentially a chicken and egg problem? Uh, because the less you expect children at younger years to make certain decisions for themselves, well, the less they're going to be able to make decisions for themselves. So it may be that elementary school age really are not capable of certain things that the high schoolers would be. And I, I would uh, not be surprised if that were true. But it seems also that if you were to kind of add in bits and pieces, you would get them ready for something like that maybe even earlier than they otherwise would be. Absolutely. Yeah. The other thing I would say, just from a practical perspective, is, you know, if you start any, a school like this, a school within a school now with 10th graders, there's a lot of unlearning they have to do. I mean, and I think Sam can mm -hmm. speak to this in terms of what happened in the independent project. Kids who, and we talk about this, he talks about this in the book, who it took them a while to realize no adult was hanging over their shoulder. Yeah, I mean, for sure. We, I mean, I ended up uh, including this thing, uh, the, this thing I called the sort of deorientation, um, which was the first week uh, was com of the program was completely dedicated to just kind of breaking down some of the sort of assumptions that had built up, and 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 certainly that didn't just end at the end on the end of that first week. It carried over, but I mean, you know, the the sort of um, simple sort of try example is is the first few days that the bells rang for the rest of the school and everyone got up and started to move their stuff and I said you know where are you going you know that you're, you <laughs> we don't follow those anymore but that that carried over into bigger more important things you know 
for example, unlearning that that science was just a collection of facts and and having having to break that down before they could start thinking about what it meant to pursue a question scientifically, you know, the answer to a question scientifically, um, or yeah, uh, you know, learn uh, unlearning the fact that they basically weren't going to get a slap on the wrist when they messed up. Instead, they had to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. And I, I remember feeling, you know, they did sort of unlearn all that and, and hit their stride and get going. And they all talked about that process a lot and how, how amazing that was to sort of discover this new, well, discover that they loved learning, basically. Um, but I remember feeling kind of so unfair, like, uh, if I didn't have to waste these, if we all didn't have to waste these first few weeks erasing all the bad stuff that we had gotten ingrained into us, uh, think how much further we could go. Well, so uh, I, don't, I guess we're here in late uh, September 2016. So as of now, do you know how the school is doing? I know it went through, I think, two pilots. So uh, what is it, has it been ongoing since then? Yeah, so um, the independent project has has gone on every year uh, at my at my high school. It's it's changed uh, each year with the new cohort of students who have new ideas about what and how they should be learning. Um, uh, most importantly, we graduated from having to work out of the um, the coach's office of the girls' locker room into the uh, a workshop space. So that was a <laughs> I, I never got to see that, but that was a big big bonus. Um, and but you know every year, uh, even though it graduated from its pilot status, every year it faces sort of renewed. Uh, there's there's always skepticism, and there's always teachers who or people who uh, don't think it it makes sense and would rather see it not there, um, whether they feel threatened by it or or just don't believe in the ideas. Um, and so, for example, there was one year, I guess uh, two years ago, that I heard that it was probably going to get uh, pulled. Um, but then I found out a couple of months later that a young a student who was a rising senior, so who had been a freshman um, when, I, when I started the independent project, uh, rallied very hard and worked and, and got it uh, to stay at the school. So, you know, I, 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 you know I'm not there anymore. It's not, it's not my, I, my thing. It's the, it belongs to whoever the students who are in it at any given time. But, you know, a part of me certainly wonders every every summer sort of what will happen happen next in the face of uh, people who are still, well, who are still skeptics, I suppose. Great. Well, uh, Sam, Susan, thank you for uh, being on and talking about the Independent Project. I hope that people see this and are inspired to um, look at this model and, and potentially take it, maybe modify it if need be, you know, do something on their own. So hopefully uh, this inspires a lot of people.